Uh, can you hear me at the back? Okay, good, good. Um, uh, my name's Sam Miller. As, thank you very much, Vikas, for that introduction. Um, we've got a mixture of five different cities. Four of them are in India. One of them is a total outlier, you might say, because it's no longer a city, but once was a great urban center. Um, I'm going to begin by asking each of our participants to talk about their city and their special connection with it, and then we're going to broaden the, the conversation to discuss some of the issues that affect these cities and affected them in the past. Um, I'd like to ask Hugh Thompson to begin, Machu Picchu. I'm beginning, by the way, in order of distance from, um, from Jaipur. So the first is clearly Machu Picchu in Peru. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Yes, I feel a little bit like the outlier with Machu Picchu, which is a place I've gone back to over many years and taken expeditions to look for Inca ruins nearby. So as a place I know well, I've got a few pictures to introduce it to you. Although, let us just have a quick show of hands. Who's actually been there? Who here has been there? No, none of you are allowed to ask questions afterwards, but thank you. And can we have the first yes? So this is the book I wrote about uh, Machu Picchu, that area of Peru, the White Rock. And next slide, please. And here it is, of course, the famous city, a sort of icon for 20th century archaeology. It's amazing to think that it was only discovered 100 years ago, or just over, in 1911. Uh, so it's a very recent discovery in some ways, and built, of course, by the Incas, uh, probably in around 1460. The Incas had no history, so we have no written records, but about, about that sort of time span. Next picture, please. So in Peru, of course, it was the old Inca capital, uh, near the old Inca capital of Cusco, Machu Picchu, in the mountains, and now visited by some half a million to a million visitors a year, a huge amount who, as you can see here, are rather obscuring the view for everybody else with their, with their cameras. And as you walk around Machu Picchu today, it is an old city, it may be what happens to some of these modern cities we're going to discuss in a moment. It's a ghost city now. You'll hear guides describing what it must have been like. Uh, luckily, the Inca architecture built, they built their windows wider at the bottom than at the top. So they make very convenient perches uh, for people as they, as they wander around. Or indeed, they can lie down in the hotel next to the ruins and view it from there. Uh, but the Incas built in a wonderfully reflective way. They had great empathy for the landscape, for the mountains. They built cities in a way we can only envy. Machu Picchu is still an extraordinary achievement, this city built in the clouds. Um, it's, it is an icon. We don't understand it fully still, and I think that's fascinating, and maybe that will happen to some of our own modern cities now when it's discovered in the future. Many people go there now, feel that it must have been a spiritual place because they, rather like this lady here, feel spiritual themselves when they visit. But I would question that suggestion and think that it's probably wrong. I think we should view Machu Picchu more. Picchu when he did discover it in 1911, still covered in vegetation. Um, a ram romantic place, this little boy wandering around the ruins of the Torreon at the center of the city. Uh, it was covered in uh, forestation, of course, because it's in the cloud forest. And so he came back the following year of a big expedition, burnt the forest, which is not an approved method for clearing cities, by the way, pyro archaeology, revealed it all, and took a lot of pictures. And he made it famous because he worked very closely with National Geographic, He's the model, of course, for Indiana Jones. Spielberg has said he based Indiana Jones on Hiram Bingham. You can see here the way he poses with the high boots and the Stetson. He hasn't got the bull, the raw, the, the bull hide whip, but that's all he's missing. National Geographic did a huge article about Machu Picchu with a pull-out poster, so they really made it famous. Uh, but there was a problem, which was that Bingham had to explain why the city was there. He had to fill out a whole issue of National Geographic with an explanation, which was difficult until one of his companions claimed that most of the bones that they're discovering here in a little cave in Machu Picchu, that most of these bones were female, 
which was terrific because immediately Bingham had his story. This, he said, was a place where the virgins of the sun must have lived, to be visited occasionally by a lucky Inca emperor. And this is a great legend. He did Machu Picchu wonderful service as a poster story. And Bingham popularized it in his own book. I brought out another introduction of his fabulous book, Lost City of the Incas, a few years ago, a modern edition. And it's a legend that stuck. But just to finish my very short introduction to Machu Picchu, it's a legend that's wrong, almost completely wrong. Later analysis has shown the bones were not mainly female. And the current thinking of archaeologists, which maybe chimes with modern times and with modern cities, is that this was not some great spiritual retreat for the Incas. It was more like a Las Vegas. It was built with fabulous architecture by Inca, Inca emperors so they could retreat in the winter months from Cusco, which is cold, to the warmer climate here. It's show-off architecture, where every stone fits brilliantly without any mortar whatsoever. It's the architecture of an emperor who had 25 million people to do his commands, who could say, I want a fabulous city built in the clouds. Build it for me. So thank you very much. A short introduction, but I hope an enticing one. Uh, thank you very much, Hugh. I think we'll be returning to the issue of whether our living cities can learn anything from the dead cities of the past. Um, I'd like now to call on Kushanava Chaudhry, who's written a wonderful book, Epic City, about Calcutta. Give us a, an idea, both of your connection to Calcutta, and if you would be so good as to read a small bit, just to give us an idea of the book. Sure, as you wish. Hi, my name is Kushinava Chaudhary. Thank you all for coming. I, uh, I wrote this book, The Epic City, The World on the Streets of Calcutta. I moved, my family moved uh, from Calcutta to the US when I was 12. And I went to high school and uh, university in the US. And then uh, when I was 22, I came back to Calcutta uh, myself to work at a newspaper called The Statesman. And uh, since then, I've had this kind of oscillating back and forth relationship uh, with the city, and eventually I decided to write a book about it. And the section I'm going to read right now is about the first time that I come back uh, in 2001 uh, to work at the Statesman as a newspaper reporter. Everything that could possibly be wrong with the city was wrong with Calcutta. The city is situated between a river and a swamp. Its weather, Mark Twain had said, was enough to make a brass doorknob mushy. For six months out of the year, you are never dry. You take two to three showers a day to keep cool, but you start sweating the moment you turn off the tap. The dry winter months when I arrived were worse. I woke up some mornings feeling like my chest was on fire. Breathing in Calcutta, Manoj, the neighborhood doctor, told me, was like smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Keeping the dust and grime off my body, out of my nails, hair, and lungs was a daily struggle. Then there were the mosquitoes, which arrived in swarms at sundown and often came bearing malaria. I could look forward to the monsoons, of course, when floodwaters regularly reached your waist in parts of the city. When they weren't flooded, the streets were blocked by marches, rallies, barricades, and bus burnings, all of which passed for normal politics in the city. Staying cool, dry, healthy, and sane took up so much effort that it left little enthusiasm for much else. Nothing had changed since my childhood. The Panwalas still ruled the street corners, perched on stoops with their bottles of cold drinks and neatly arranged cigarette packets. On the streets, the pushers and pullers of various types of carts still transported goods, uh, transported most of the city's goods. The footpaths were still overrun by hawkers selling bulbous side bags, shirts, combs, peanuts, and minuscule sachets, onion fritters, and vegetable chow mein. The mildewed concrete buildings, the bowl-shaped ambassador taxis, the paintings on the backs of buses, the ubiquitous political graffiti, the posters stuck on any flat surface, the bazaars full of squatting fish sellers, the tea shop benches on the sidewalks, the caged balconies of the middle classes, the narrow entrails of corrugated slums, nothing had changed, not even the impassive expressions on the faces of clerks. The city was in its own time zone. It was not a very happy time. Calcutta was in its 23rd year of communist rule, 
its third decade of factory closures. Until the 1970s, it had been the largest and most industrialized city in India, but had now been eclipsed in population and prosperity by Bombay and Delhi. The only reason that politicians seems to visit, seem to visit the city anymore was to pronounce its death. Since the early 90s, life in other parts of India had been improving for people like us, the educated few. The government had loosened its hold over the economy, and dollars were flowing into the American back offices and call centers located in Bangalore and Hyderabad. Countless college-educated young men and women, including many of my cousins, had fled Calcutta for these boom towns. On my mother's side, none of my cousins remained in the city. My generation had gone missing, leaving behind a city of geriatrics who busied themselves with bilirubin levels and stool analyses. Their blood test results were kept in plastic bags as if they were examination mark sheets or graduation certificates to be presented to visitors along with tea and biscuits. Why had I come back, everyone asked. It would be one thing if I had come back to take care of my ailing parents, but my parents lived in America. Maybe I did not get along with my parents, asked the bank officer when I went to the local branch to open an account. Could I not get a job in America, asked the man who, opened, who ran the coffee shop in the bazaar. Had the Americans, for some reason, thrown me out, wondered a colleague at the Statesman. Well then, if I must stay in India, they all advise, I had better clear it out of Calcutta. If I had any career ambitions at all, I should go to Delhi, Bangalore, or Bombay. I had that magic wand that opened all doors in India. After all, even if I had been booted out of America, I still had a foreign degree. I knew why I was back, even though I did not tell people this, fearing that they would scoff at my naivete. But like the revolutionaries of my parents' generation, I hoped to change things. But there was no revolution left for me to join in Calcutta, no ideology one could reasonably adhere to, no dream left. My best hope for making a difference was to work at a newspaper. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Krishnoba. Um I'd like now to ask um, Yatindra Mishra to talk about Faisabad and your connection with it. Um, I, I think of the Indian cities here, it's probably the least visited, uh, but it's a wonderful place, as anyone who's been there will know. It's got just the finest Nawabi architecture, two tombs there, which um, you must all visit if you haven't. Yatindra. Thank you, Sam Miller ji. Shahnama Fezabad. Ye maine kitab tayar ki Fezabad ke dastavejon ko dekhkar, British gazetteers ko dekhkar, aur purane jo insha padhati aur jo khushkhat mein Fezabad likha gaya tha ki Fezabad kya hai. Fezabad ek aisa shahar hai jo banne se pehle hi bigad gaya, kyunki jab Nawabi ki niyuv rakhi gayi Fezabad mein 1722 mein Nawab Saadat Ali Khan Burhanul Mulk ne rakhi aur wo apna vikas kar hi rahi thi ki Asif Udawla ne apni maa se jhagda karke sen 1775 mein capital transfer kar diya Lucknow. Bavan saal ka itihaas hai Fezabad ka jis mein jaisa ki Sam ne kaha ki bahut badi buildings bani ek nawabi architecture aya lekin agar Lucknow ko aap padna chahate hai to uske backdrop mein uske आपको एक अंतरधारा की तरह अगर आपको कोई शहर देखना है तो फैजाबाद देखना होगा हर चीज़ फैजाबाद में बनती है और लखनऊ जाकर विकसित होती है हमारे यहाँ रस्क रश्क जैसे डांस कहते हैं अदब लिटरेचर और मौसी की म्यूज़िक ये तीनों फैजाबाद शुजाउदौला के पीरियड में सबसे ज़्यादा डेवलप हुआ लेकिन जब शायरों को ये लगने लगा कि अभी मामला कुछ गड़बड़ है और फैजाबाद में हमें काम नहीं मिलेगा और आसिफ उदौला लखनऊ की तैयारी कर रहे हैं तो ज़्यादातर पढ़ने लिखने वाले लखनऊ चले गए इंशा पद्धति लेखन कहलाती है जो सबसे अच्छे ढंग की सरकारी पत्रोच्चार होते थे जो गजट दिए जाते थे जो सम्मान दिए जाते थे जो सनदें दी जाती हैं आपने बहुत सुना होगा कि इनके पास ये सनद है और उसकी शुरुआत फैजाबाद करता है जो भी सनदें आपको पुराने उर्दू और फारसी में मिलती हैं नवाबी पीरियड की 
उसकी शुरुआत फैजाबाद में होती है और उसकी शुरुआत कराने में किसी नवाब का हाथ नहीं है नवाब की माँ का हाथ है नवाब बेगम का फैजाबाद शहर दो मलकाए फैजाबादों से बना हुआ है एक नवाब बेगम है और दूसरी बहू बेगम है जिनका मकबरा है और जिनके मकबरे को लेकर के ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ने उन्हें धोखा दिया क्योंकि उन्होंने ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के साथ एक ऐसा करार किया बहू बेगम ने कि मेरी गुप्त वसीयत हो जो आसिफ उदौला को ना जाए क्योंकि आसिफ उदौला सारे धन को बर्बाद कर देगा मैं बहुत छोटे में फैज़ाबाद बता रहा हूँ इस किताब में बहुत डिटेल में है लिटरेचर को लेकर के आर्किटेक्चर को लेकर के म्यूज़िक को लेकर के और तमाम सारी चीज़ों को लेकर के बनने की शुरुआत नवाबी के बनने की शुरू वैसे तो अवध प्रोविंस में बहुत सारे शहर आते थे लेकिन राजधानी चूँकि पहली फैज़ाबाद चुनी गई तो फैज़ाबाद में ही ये सारी चीज़ें आपको मिलती हैं इसको आप ब्रिटिश गजेटियर से भी चेक कर सकते हैं और इसको तमाम उन पुरानी किताबों से कदीम लखनऊ की आखिरी बहार या मिर्दा फैज बख्श का फर फराह बख्श से आप चेक कर सकते हैं तो उसमें ये आता है कि जो आर्किटेक्चर है जो आ, कलात्मक ढंग का आ, पेंटिंग है जिसे आज हम ऑयल पेंटिंग कहते हैं पोर्ट्रेट पेंटिंग कहते हैं आ, वो के, टिली कैटल जो पहला फ्रांसीसी चित्रकार था वो फैज़ाबाद आता है शुजाउदौला के न्योते पर और ढेर सारी नवाबों की तस्वीरें बनाता है आज भी आपको लखनऊ के पिक्चर गैलरी में जो बड़े नवाबों के पोर्ट्रेट्स मिलेंगे उसमें से आधे दर्जन फैज़ाबाद में बने हैं और फैज़ाबाद से ट्रांसफ़र हुए गुलाबबाड़ी का जो बहुत बड़ा मकबरा है वो सफदरजंग को एक दिन के दफनाए जाने के लिए प्रतीक रूप में बनाया गया था जिन्हें बाद में दिल्ली शिफ्ट किया गया और वहाँ फिर उनके बेटे को दफनाया गया उनके मृत्यु के बाद शुजाउदौला को फैज़ाबाद ये तो नवाबी को घेरता है लेकिन जैसे नवाबी से बाहर आता है हमारे मॉडर्न इंडिया में आता है वो बेगम अख्तर का शहर बन जाता है वो डॉक्टर राम मनोहर लोहिया का शहर बन जाता है वो आचार्य नरेंद्र देव का शहर बन जाता है किससे कहानियों में वो उमराव जान का शहर बनता है जबकि इतिहास में उमराव जान नाम की कोई भी तवायफ ढूंढने पे नहीं मिलती वो कोई भी गजेटियर कोई भी पत्रोचार और किसी भी तरह का डॉक्यूमेंट उमराव जान को के बारे में कुछ नहीं बताता सिवाय इस बात को कि मिर्जा हादी रसवा जब उमराव जान लिखते हैं तो वो एक ऐसा फिक्शियस करेक्टर बनाते हैं एक फिक्शन में कल्पना करते हैं कि बहु बेगम के मकबरे के दरोगा की बेटी हैं उमराव जान जबकि ऐसी कोई साक्ष्य उमराव जान को लेकर नहीं मिलते और ऐसा बहुत सारे विद्वानों का मामला है कि मिर्जा हादी रसवा की तमाम शायरों से शायराओं से मुलाकातें रही होंगी जो बट बैठ की और खड़ी महफिलें करती थी उनमें से कोई एक चरित्र ऐसा रहा होगा जिसको लेकर उन्होंने उमराव जान का जीवन गढ़ा फैज़ाबाद इस मामले में एक परंपरा और आधुनिकता के बीच अदब कायदे तमीज़ और बिल्कुल उससे निकल कर एक नए ढंग के ज़मीन पर खड़ा हुआ शहर है और उसके नाम में जो सन्निहित है कि फैज़ और आबाद कि खुदा के फैज़ से खुदा की कृपा से जो शहर आबाद रहे वो फैज़ाबाद होता है लेकिन दुर्भाग्य ये है हमारे कंटेम्प्रेरी टाइम्स में भी ये है ये कुछ ऐसा कुछ मामला है कि फैज़ाबाद आबाद नहीं रह पाया अभी उसे और बनने की ज़रूरत है और किसी भी महानगर की तरह फैज़ाबाद नहीं है वो एक छोटे से शहर और छोटे से कस्बे की तरह रह गया है जिसे अभी बहुत तरक्की की ज़रूरत है धन्यवाद um uh, and finally i'd like to ask um esther david to talk about amdabad amdabad incidentally i discovered today is 10 kilometers nearer to jaipur than faizabad so this explains my uh, reasoning of the order of speaking uh, esther and again a wonderful city with again undervisited but i think it's right in saying the only city in india with um world heritage status so uh can you hear me yes okay um i have been writing about amdavad for most of my life entirely because there are many reasons i grew up in the old city of amdavad which is also known as the walled city and for me cities actually exist in the mind because it's known as the wall city and the title of my first novel was the wall city but it's basically a city with a lot of darwazas gates less walls one or two which are being restored after the world uh, unesco heritage tag so i think sam you want me to read a part yes you please from 
<laughs> my uh, book. Um, I also want to say that uh, sometimes when people ask me what Ahmedabad means to me, and I always tell them that it's always the East Ahmedabad, the old Ahmedabad, that's the walled city. The west beyond the river Sabarmati is West Ahmedabad. I live there geographically, but my heart is always in west, uh, East Ahmedabad. That's where I'm there. So I place Ahmedabad as, uh, in all my novels it appears like a stage where the novel is enacted. That's how I write. So let me start with a little, and the second thing, I'm not a historian. I collect stories and fables. I talk to people, I sit down uh, over uh, chai, these kitlis we call them in Ahmedabad, where I chat with a lot of people and I come back with my own stories. So that's for Ahmedabad for me. Um, there are many stories about the existence of Goddess Lakshmi in Ahmedabad. It is said, late one night, when the goddess stood at the main entrance of the city at Teen Darwaza, that is three gates, and knocked on the massive gates, the guard, Khwaja Siddiqui, allowed her to enter, left her there, locked the door from inside, and went to the palace to take permission from the Sultan. He was beheaded for leaving the goddess standing at the gate. The Sultan rushed to welcome the goddess, but by then, she had disappeared into the city. Another version of the story is that the Sultan deliberately beheaded the guard so that Lakshmi could not leave the city as the gates were locked and she had to stay back in the city. There is also a third version that goddess Lakshmi was already in the walled city but wanted to leave at midnight and requested the guard to open the doors. Siddiqui realized that if she left, the city would lose its prosperity. So he asked her to wait, saying he had to take the Sultan's permission. He rushed to the Sultan and requested to be beheaded because if he did not return to open the gate, the goddess would stay back in Ahmedabad and according to legend, she did. Jabbar Mirza, comes from a family of caretakers of Lakshmi's lamp, which is in a niche in the three gates, the Teen Darwaza, which has been kept burning in an alcove at Teen Darwaza. He continued this tradition till he died. Now his wife and his family look after this lamp, and it's uh, like an eternal lamp to Ahmedabad. For me, it is one of the most important places. I revere it. Uh, shopkeepers believe that even if recession sets in, it will never affect them because Goddess Lakshmi's presence is in the city. The city abounds in success stories, like that of the man who went peddling, washing powder, house to house, on a bicycle, and eventually became one of Gujarat's most iconic industrialists. There are many such tales of small beginnings which led daring men to great works. Uh, can I read a little more? Or is it okay? Yeah. Huh? Little bit. A little, okay. Uh, I will just, uh, because you, you mentioned Hanuman, so I'll just uh, read a small part about Hanuman later. Okay. So we'll continue step by step about Lakshmi and the many fables. Um. Partly for time reasons, but also because we're going to have a big session on Delhi and Calcutta tomorrow. I'm not going to read about Delhi today, but I am just going to read one paragraph, which is about Delhi, but really I think it's about every living city in the world, and in a way it relates to the possibility of all of these cities no longer living of failing and dying. I'll just read this one paragraph. Delhi's population has doubled in the time I have known it. 
It has become, for better and for worse, a world city. It has everything that is old and everything that is modern. It still has its majestic scattered ruins that, for me, equal those of Rome or Athens of Cairo. But it has largely lost the parochial quality I remember from the 1990s. Today, Delhi makes the city of my birth, London, feel quiet and peripheral. Delhi has a sense of continuous decay and regeneration that I have not met elsewhere. And I find myself preaching to anyone who will listen that the world ignores Delhi's current experiments with modernity at its peril. Sometimes, because large cities are so large and they can make us feel so small as individuals, we lose hope about changing anything. We forget that we human beings have created these cities, these monsters. They're entirely our responsibility. And so in the end, my sermon continues. We will collectively get the cities we deserve. For that reason, we must come to believe that our great cities needn't be hell on earth, that they might even become better than purgatory. The world's urban pasts are brimming with failures, a world in which Delhi is an incubator for an uncertain urban future. Um, I think the point I'm trying to make there is that all great cities of the past have died, um, or are kind of unrecognizable. There may have been continuous habitation, but they're unrecognizable. And it's almost a sort of big question for everyone thinking about cities, is what happens to them in the long run. We're living very much in the present. And the title of this session is um, Cities, Past and Future. And we need to, in a sense, climb out of the present and think about what's happened and what might happen. I'd like first to turn to you on that issue, Kushanaba, because the imminent death of Calcutta has been predicted many times in the past, but it's still there. What do you make of this idea of the death of a city? Yeah, um, yeah you know, I mean, uh, there's a famous story about Mark Twain that uh, the newspapers had once published fal a false report that he had died, and then the next day he sent a telegram to the newspaper and he said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. And uh, Calcutta, I feel like, uh, has been getting exaggerated reports of his death for my whole life. I mean, you know, in the mid-80s, Rajiv Gandhi came to Calcutta when he was prime minister and said this is a dying city. Uh, that was 30 years ago. It's still uh, not only not dying, but it happens to be one of the largest cities in the world and one of the largest agglomerations of human beings in the history of humanity, right, to think about uh, what it actually is uh, in a larger context. So, uh, you know, to me it's a very funny thing when you say that a place which has 15, 16 million people is dying or dead, right? Uh, I mean, what exactly about it is dying or dead? Not the people, because they continue to live there and reproduce and have families and, and have more and more generations. So what you're really saying is that the way of life of those people is dying or dead. Uh, now, who is that dying or dead to? To them? or to somebody else. One of the very interesting things that I had experienced after the book came out, and a lot of the reviews, people say, to, say in the review that it's a very nostalgic book. And I didn't understand what they meant by nostalgic because I was writing a book that, you know, is about the 2000s, 2000, 2000, the last, my work ends in 2010, right? So it took me a few years to write the book and, and all that, but I'm not writing about history, right? And so what I realized is that what they, what they mean when they say that it's a nostalgic book is that in their minds, the way of life in Calcutta today is something of the past. It doesn't belong in the India of the present, right? That tells me a lot more about the person talking than about the city. Because what it tells me is that they have an ideology of what kind of cities should, should be, we should be and have in the future. Mm. And in that schemata, the city that I know and live in and to which I have a, a relationship that, uh, uh, that, I, you know, that, 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 uh, that is, that is you know, deeply, uh, uh, you know, almost like umbilical, uh, that city s no longer exists. It ceases to be a feasible 
form of uh, urban settlement, right? To me, that's, a, that's a, 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 a very revealing picture of current, current psychosis in India, mm. which says that places like Gurgaon or Noida or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, um, uh, uh, you know the, 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 the emptier and higher uh, and more unsustainable the city, the more futuristic it is, mm. right? Uh, you know, and uh, what I wonder about such people is, what kind of a future do they imagine for the entire country? For the 90% of cities that are somewhere between Faisabad and Ahmedabad and Calcutta, right? That will never become smart or 25 stories, right? Uh, what, what do you think that, that that kind of Indian urban settlement is going to be in your future? Well, these futures have to be imagined and I think they haven't been is part of the problem. Um, uh, Esther, would you reflect on, I mean, how much do you fear for the future of your city? Not at all. I think the <laughs> old city of Ahmedabad is a, uh, really a living heritage city. Mm -hmm. On one side we have West Ahmedabad where we <coughs> have Corbusier and Louis Kahn's architecture and uh, we have Gandhi Ashram and we have the Sarkej Rosa. So we have a very beautiful link up and we have the best of the design schools and uh, all sorts of schools there There's with no the most beautiful architecture. No, no, it's, I'm not saying there are no <laughs> problems. There are problems like everywhere. Yeah. But what you are saying about nostalgia and us, uh, like our people still have retained uh, the Gujarat, Gujaratis mm. in general, uh, whether they live in America or they come back and they move from East to West Ahmedabad, they have retained mm. a certain uh, sort of a uh, very strong local feeling. Mm. So every time you feel that you are in a smart city and you want the real Ahmedabad, you just have to cross the river and go on the other side and you are there. And you have the living city there. And people are so wonderful on that side of the city and even this side. Mm. I mean, I have never met, even the rickshaw allahs or anything, I have never met. Uh, okay, a little ahead what you call mm. smart city does exist in a different way. But people are people, they're like Gujaratis, basically. Like in a very simple example I'll give you, that when you go to a shop, not in a mall, because they follow you like police, uh, but in a simple shops you go to, and people say, come, 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 come and look, and you don't have to pay to look, I mean, so that's how it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, Yatindraji, what do you think is the future for Faisabad? फैजाबाद की समस्या ये है कि अयोध्या से जुड़ा है और लखनऊ से जुड़ा है नवाबी लखनऊ ले उड़ी बाकी जो बचा है वो अयोध्या के लिए जाता है कि वो एक धर्म की नगरी है वो भगवान राम से जुड़ा हुआ वहाँ उसका उसका सपना है तो फैजाबाद इज इज़ ए मिक्स ब्लेंड ऑफ रिलीजन एंड नवाबी एंड एवरी आप उसमें uh, ये नहीं देख सकते कि उसका अपना करेक्टर खड़ा नहीं हो पाया क्योंकि जिस समय वो बना और उसका जो एक नॉस्टाइल जिया है कि आप जा करके आपने मुझसे शुभा कहा कि गुलाबबाड़ी वाज फैंटास्टिक तो गुलाबबाड़ी है बहु बेगम का मकबरा है इतने से शहर नहीं बनता इतने से शहर की धड़कनें सांस नहीं लेती क्योंकि वहाँ पर अच्छे इंस्टीट्यूशंस की ज़रूरत है पढ़ाई की ज़रूरत है और तमाम सारा व्यापार की ज़रूरत है जो वहाँ पर लोग आएँ और अपना पैसा लगाएँ वो शहर अयोध्या की वजह से जाना जाता है आप जब बताते हैं फैज़ाबाद तो कोई नहीं समझता कि मैं फैज़ाबाद से अच्छा फरीदाबाद से हैं आप लेकिन जब आप बताते हैं कि आप अयोध्या से हैं अच्छा वो अयोध्या वाला फैज़ाबाद तो अयोध्या से वो मिला हुआ है एंड दोनों ट्विन सिटीज़ हैं और ट्विन सिटीज़ के बीच में तीन किलोमीटर का फासला है जयपुर में तीन किलोमीटर पर कोई दूसरा शहर नहीं हो सकता जयपुर ही होगा तो आप किसी बड़े शहर से महानगर से या कॉस्मोपोलिटन कल्चर से उत्तर प्रदेश के छोटे कस्बाई शहरों की मानसिकता नहीं पकड़ सकते लेकिन नवाबी उठ के चली गई लखनऊ में तो हर चीज़ लखनऊ में होती है दुनिया भर की किताबें भी लिखी जाएंगी तो लखनऊ की ग्लोरी गाएंगी वो वहाँ की बात कहेंगी वो कहेंगे ये तो हमारी लखनऊी तहजीब है कोई नहीं जानता कि फैज़ाबादी तहजीब है जो उठ के गई है वो वहाँ से उठा ली गई है और जो एक छोटा सा शहर है वो मथुरा या वृंदावन की तरह है उसकी अपनी नुआंसेज हैं उसके अपने दबाव हैं उसके अपने अपने संस्कार हैं तो फैज़ाबाद लोग आते हैं रुकते हैं अयोध्या में आके दर्शन करते हैं घूमते हैं और निकल जाते हैं तो फैज़ाबाद एक बाईपास पे खड़ा हुआ ठिठका शहर है जो आपको एयरपोर्ट जाने की सहूलियत देता है फैज़ाबाद में रह कर के कुछ कर पाएँ मुझे लगता है कि इसमें भी बहुत साल लगने हैं और इसके लिए सरकारों को सोचने की ज़रूरत है um, 
Hugh, I want to ask you a question to which you can answer no. Good. Um, are there lessons any of these cities can learn from what happened from the story of Machu Picchu? And the story of the past. Well, I've just returned with a friend who's also in, in the audience from Sao Paulo, which is the biggest city in the Americas. It's bigger than Delhi, not that it's a competition. It's a huge, huge city. And I was fascinated by what it reveals about where we are going with our cities. And I, when I got there, I couldn't quite work out what was wrong about Sao Paulo, or rather what was disturbing me. And then I realized that uh, the wise city fathers have banned all billboards completely. There's absolutely no uh, advertising uh, around the city, which gives it a very weird feel uh, because it feels like uh, the retro future. It feels like a future city, but one that's faded without any of our modern 20th century advertising. Um, and I think that's a very important point with the city, that we've always assumed the sort of 19th century model that the city is always improving, that cities are always getting better, are being more planned. And I feel with many of them, we may have reached more of a tipping point where we are receding with cities. Uh, and Sao Paulo, you get uh, slums, favelas, nestling cheek by jowl with uh, extraordinary monuments to modern architecture. The whole thing is a dreamlike mix, and of course, it extends so far on the horizon, you think you're seeing a CGI simulation of, of a multiplied city if you stand in the center and look out from it. And the other thing that it reminded me very weirdly of was the film Brazil, Terry Gilliam's film Brazil, which was a brilliant imaginative view of such a retro future city. He actually called it Brazil, not because of the country Brazil, but because there's a song called Brazil he plays all through the film. But it was, I think, Terry Gilliam's vision, and this vision I saw in Sao Paulo, of cities of the future which are declining and where the retro is side by side with the modern and the futuristic, uh, is one we will increasingly come to see. And I suppose, Sam, your own Delhi is the ultimate example of a city where cities nestle within each other, where you have the modern and the old rings of concentric circles of cities, um, and, uh, and you're never quite sure where, where, where the past begins and the future ends, so to speak. I think that's absolutely true about Delhi. And it may be the way we avoid cities dying, is building the new city on top of the old, but not destroying the old at that time. Vikas, you, do you fear for our cities? Uh, I just have a point to make, uh, which was when the contrast between Ahmedabad and Calcutta and how you know cities continue to grow. Gujaratis as a community, I think, are the most nostalgic community. And anywhere they go, they look for a Gujarati for son. I mean, Hindu Ben Kakra Wali would keep sending courier of Kakras to you know Kenya and US. But the way the city has changed or the way the city has grown uh, is quite in contrast to Calcutta. Uh, you have the walled city, which is now a world heritage site. They picked up their learnings from the past, how you know the pole culture was there in Ahmedabad. And they built it up in the new Ahmedabad. So you have National Institute of Design which is a new, this thing, you have IAM, you have ISRO. So there's a blend of both modernity as well as past. But in Calcutta, that seems to have somehow, you know, not learned, and it still is fighting for its own riverbank, modern institutes. So that is where I think the city failed to learn, I think. Okay. Esther, you would... My, my uh, I feel my little clip will answer all of the questions I've created in the, instead of talking. Um, I don't think we <laughs> sorry, we've got 13 minutes left. Um, we'll, I, I'm just going to ask the panel one series more of questions, and then we'll pass it out to the audience. Um, I really wanted to know, um, those of you who've written about cities, do you have to leave that city to really understand it? Can you know a city just by being in it? I know you've got a complicated in-out relationship with Calcutta, Kushnava. Yeah, I think, I think maybe you do. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things is that when you leave a city, you stop kind of reproducing the same things. You know, the problem that we, many of us have is that the lives that we're living 
and uh, the lives that we narrate are very different, right? So, by mm. which I mean that we say, oh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have we have this rhetoric of you know whatever it is anti-corruption, civic sense, cleanliness, mm. planning, 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 uh, and yet the thing that we enjoy about living in a city is uh, the people that we live around, or the places where we you know go to eat, or the places where we go to hang out, or the kind of jokes that are only made in certain places in certain cities that will never be understood by other people in other cities, mm. uh, that require a certain kind of context. The way the air smells after it rains. You know, the, the, the way the rivalries of sports teams uh, play out in certain neighborhoods. Mm. Things that are very particular and local and unreproducible. But we never write about those things. Mm. We only live them. When we write, when we speak, when the newspapers talk, it's always about planning and statecraft and administration and, and politics, which has nothing to do with actually the experiences of cities. When you leave a city, so much of what you miss is not the lack of planning. It's the tangible, those kind mm. of ineffable things about a city, right? Mm. And I think that that's important to remember. And it's also important to remember that we have accomplished a great deal in our cities. Mm. Calcutta, it's true, may not have been able to do many of the kind of planned things design-wise that Ahmedabad was able to do. But you have to understand that Calcutta, when this country became independent, was a city of mass starvation, mass homelessness, and mass collective violence, right? Three million people had died in Bengal in the famine in 43. The, po the population of people who came as refugees uh, between 47 to 52 increased the population of Calcutta in five years as much as it would have in 50 years. Unlike in Delhi, there was no mm. place to put them. No planning was done for them, right? Mm. The planning all had to be done by indiv individual communities, right? Doing it on their mm. own uh, with the help of political parties, mm. right? They had to squat, essentially, mm. on land that they had no claims over. And the kind of violence that had taken place in Calcutta had never taken place on that scale anywhere else in India in 46. The, the riots that produced partition, mm. which have never happened since partition. So there are many things that the city accomplished. It made sure nobody starved to death. It made sure that people who came with nothing were able to have a decent life in one or two generations. And it made sure that we never had the kind of communal violence uh, that we had in that city ever again in the post-independence period. Uh, Esther, last point before we go to questions. Yeah. I think uh, Ahmedabad also has had a lot of what you're saying and uh, I feel the city absorbs a lot and we keep going. That's the character of the people of Ahmedabad, uh, Gujarat rather. And uh, I just wanted to say that when we are at a distance from a city, definitely the outlines do become sharper. I don't say that they don't. Mm. But a city that you know very well, which you love, which you study, it is inside you. Mm. It is never at a distance. That's all. Okay, thank you, Esther. Um, questions? Hands up, yes. <coughs> the gentleman there in the, in the aisle, that's right. Uh, most of the cities you're talking about, uh, all of you have grown up in that city. But uh, would you also have some idea of how does a migrant which who comes to into a city, because now most of our cities are actually migrant cities. The original inhabitants who you would say have stayed there for generations, say in a place like Delhi or a Mumbai, probably will be in a minority and the people who have come in in the last 30, 40, 50 years. So how do, how do they change the city? Unlike in the past where it took a long time for the city's culture, culture to change because the number of migrants were much, much lower than the number of original inhabitants. So how does the city evolve and some experiences how it changes with the migrants coming into the city? I mean, I'll, I'll quickly take that because I was a migrant to Delhi, a migrant of a very particular kind, clearly, a very privileged one. Uh, but I'm very keen to assert that it's not only the original inhabitants of a city who have a right to tell that city's story. Uh, and every all of our modern cities have more people who are migrants or first generation than original inhabitants. That's how fast all of these cities have grown and we need to just accept that. Um, I don't know, is that something 
Yeah, I, I, I was just up. thinking what you're saying about migrants that they come with a certain culture and what is happening in Gujarat basically is that there are l uh, the largest number of NGOs I think who work uh, with the slum dwellers and migrants and that creates another form of culture to gives another addition to the uh, city. And actually, I myself worked in that area a lot, and I've discovered, and there are many, 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 many people who have worked with in that area, and we're very conscious of it, and we make sure that they add something to the city. I know it's a problem. It's not so easy to solve. Koshinaba, you're a migrant of, of sorts. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a real migrant. I mean, the mi I was thinking when you were t asking that question about when I started as a newspaper reporter, I remember a very senior uh, pho photographer. I had gone on a, uh, a story with him. You know, reporters and photographers usually go together. And he was a guy who was, had been you know, reporting on this, photographing the city for almost 40 years, and he would take me around. And he would take me around, and he would drive around, and he would say, look, look at these people. You know, at, at the, the, the places where uh, people had just come to the city, so the kind of land that they could get would be, say, next to a very polluted canal or something like that, not into an established slum, but just the, the first startings of a, of a squatter settlement where there had been some empty land. And he would say, you know something? In Calcutta, you will never starve to death. If you have 20 rupees in your pocket, you will survive the, till the next day in Calcutta. And that is the reason that people come, because no matter what debt you have in the countryside, or wh whoever you have antagonized by being of the wrong community or the wrong caste, or because who, who you've chosen to love is of the wrong community or the wrong caste, whatever problem that you have in the countryside, you can always flee to Calcutta and survive. Right? And that, that is the... the I think the story, the, the refuge that, that cities uh, provide, probably not just in Calcutta, but all over the world. And so no matter how uh, dying or poor such cities become, they are still in many ways the only place uh, for refugees, essentially. Not just uh, refugees of war, but refugees of, of economics, refugees of, of, of close-mindedness. And, and that is, continues to be true in the city. And I think the biggest example, you know, as I was saying, is that you know, when the, the partition happened, the cities of Delhi and Calcutta are cities of partition, nothing else. And when the partition happened, you know, the city absorbed refugees on a scale that no city in the history of, of, of the world, you know, has done. I mean, you know, if you look at uh, the kind of issues that German cities are facing now with the Syrian refugees, think of the scale of refugees that a city like Calcutta had to absorb after partition, right? Uh, this lady. Uh, I'm actually from Germany. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I don't want to argue with you on the Syrian issue, but uh, since six years, I live in a rural area in Madhya Pradesh. And many of the people think, you know, if they migrate into the cities, which 30 or 40 percent of them do, because they want to make a living, they have this dream of making a living in the city, uh, I wonder, uh, can they really make this dream? Because village life is actually quite comfortable. You know, there is clean air. There is all the kinds of things you lack in the city. Uh, and if I look at Delhi, Bangalore, Bombay, do we need another five or 10 million people in these cities who already which are already collapsing? Today, I mean, Delhi can't handle the traffic, can't handle the garbage, can't handle network, whatever, you name it. You know, all but the problems still they, But still they come, don't they? Yeah, because <laughs> the life in the villages is not really, a, you know, something you, you, you would you, love you to achieve. So yes, yes, how I, can we bridge urban and rural India? Yes, no, thank you for that. I think that's a very good question and, and maybe give a little bit of a global perspective on that as well because I travel a lot in the Americas as well as in India and this is a worldwide and very worrying phenomenon is the way that cities suck in people from the countryside. Uh, in South America these huge cities I was talking about Sao Paulo, Lima is the same in Peru, sucking in people from the villages but, but the only note of hope I would add is that certainly there it sometimes spits them back out. That the young go to the city because they've heard of these dreams of, of, of uh, entitlement and where they can em em empower their lives. But when they get there, they're disappointed. And quite often after a while, they return to those villages 
and to their rural communities. They may have been sending money there while they've been in the cities. So it's not totally one-way traffic. I think it's a very worrying phenomenon, but as I say, it, I think it is sometimes reversible uh, as well. Okay, a question right down the front here. Yes, this one. That's right. uh, so you, uh, you talked about a lot of ancient cities and how the modern cities can learn from ancient cities. So the question is, what do you think, uh, you know, the large cities like ancient cities like Machu Picchu and Peru, uh, where the modern cities can learn from it today, what they can do things in the right way and oh. probably can be more sustainable. Thank you so much. Yes, what can we learn from ancient cities like Machu Picchu? Um, I mean, I mentioned th at the beginning the wonderful way in which the Incas built to harmonize with the landscape, to respect nature, actually to reflect nature, to live with nature. Machu Picchu remains a wonderful, wonderful example of how you can do that. I mean, I've gone looking for other ancient cities uh, like Machu Picchu in the Andes. And when I've found those ruins, it's an amazing feeling, of course, to find, discover ruins like that. But I've always been struck both by a sense of elation, but also by a sense of elegy, because you, you stand in these ancient and now deserted ruins of these once great cities, and you can feel the sadness that a time has passed, a civilization has passed, in the case of the Incas, very brutally wiped out by the Spanish invaders. And I can't help thinking that maybe that will happen to some of our own cities, that once proud cities uh, that we have now, uh, in centuries to come, someone will be standing in the ruins near Times Square, covered in, in jungle, and feeling that they didn't realize what hubris, they didn't realize uh, that such great engines of cities would one day come to crumble into ruins like Ozymandias. Can we have one question? Which lady? This lady here. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Last question, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a resident of Delhi and you know, oftentimes you sit with yourself and you look at the pollution, you look at water, the garbage disposal mechanisms and you wonder what is it that as a citizen you can do, right? Uh, you can vote a party out every five years and you can be a good citizen, not litter and do things of that kind. But the bigger question to ask is, uh, can you sort of start a people's movement to really stir things up because no political party is so motivated to make a city livable, right? It's, that doesn't get you votes. Uh, with this context, it would be lovely to hear from the panelists if there are any examples globally of people's movements, uh, or if there's any been, been any city across the world which has had a you know people's movement lead towards its revival and it's uh, you know and it's gone to glory. Thanks. Um, would you like to? I think uh, Ahmedabad has tried very hard. And both the civic authorities, the municipal, the government, and the local NGOs, and um, I mean, people who are sort of very alert and conscious mm -hmm. about how to preserve the city, they are all joined together and they have tried to do it. I, I would say you mentioned Delhi. In some ways, the story of the Ahmadmi Party, which has sort of not turned out as almost anyone would have hoped, um, was a part of an attempt to do that. It's very difficult. Um, but it does involve people ultimately feeling that the city is their responsibility and feeling that they belong to it and care about it. And part of the problem with Delhi is that so many people, even now, say, oh, I'm not really from Delhi, and it turns out they came there 40 years ago. There's a lack of fundamental sort of commitment and loyalty, and I think that's very important. Yes, a final word. Yeah. See, Delhi is a very pampered city, let me say. Uh, and I also come from Delhi, and people who stay in Delhi always think that you know, everything is bad in Delhi. That client, just go to any other city and you'll see everybody is equal. One example that I would like to end up with this is the example of Indore, voted the most clean city last year. This is when all the people got down together and made sure that the city is really, really clean. Today, if you go to Indore, you would be amazed to see how clean the city has become, how clean the 
you know, the, the trees in the city are, how clean the roads are. Nobody is there urinating on the, on the roads. This only happened because everybody came down together. This is something which will be very difficult to achieve in a city like Delhi, where, you know, there's a mad race to become first. So I, I, I think it's, it's a long time before Delhi, the people really can get down together and do something good. Okay. Well, there's some hope in that. I'm afraid that's all. Time is up. Next session will start soon. There, uh, I know Kushanoba and I will be back tomorrow to talk about Delhi and Calcutta. Okay, thank you, and thanks to all the panelists. <laughs>